Our objective this evening, please God, all things being equal, is to conclude chapter 6. The chapter that introduced us to the concept of Kripa. The chapter that explains to us that in order for something to be holy, it has to be in a state of complete submission to Hashem. Meaning to say, anything that holds on to its own identity pushes Hashem out of the equation, and that is called Kripa. Anything that allows itself to lose its identity and thereby invites Hashem into the space that is called Kedusha, that is called holy. So really the thrust of this chapter was, if you remember, uh, chapters 1, but particularly 2, 3, and 4, and 5, spoke about the Nefshah, the about the godly soul. And this was the chapter that introduced us to the possibility that there is another soul that is not so holy, that is not so connected to Hashem. And many of our challenges in our personal spiritual development are because of this other soul. It's called the Nefesh Achyunis, the so-called animating soul, or the so-called animal soul. And it is something that belongs to the world of Kripa. Okay? So that got us into the conversation about what exactly defines what, that which is connected or disconnected to Hashem. And we spoke about the concept of Achoyroyim. We spoke about the concept that if a person is not submissive to Hashem, or if an item is not here to declare Hashem, to declare godliness in the world, then the relationship that it has with Hashem is Achoyroyim, which is backhanded. No personal, meaningful connection. So ultimately what we want to have is a meaningful connection with Hashem, a face-to-face -face connection where almost you get the feeling like Hashem is happy to see you and happy to engage with you and Kripa is the opposite. So at this stage what we have learned is that there's a reality called the reality of Kripa. Kripa, anything that blocks, anything that obscures, anything that conceals godliness falls into the category of Kripa. And our world we've defined as a place which is dominated by Kripa. That's why bad things happen in our world and bad people have the upper hand. That's the definition of our world. Now that we have introduced this topic called Kripa, from here until the end of the chapter, we're going to define one class of Kripa. And the next chapter, chapter 7, will be dedicated to the other class of Kripa. And we're going to draw a very significant distinction between the two kinds of Kripa that exist. In order to understand properly what it is that we're going to be learning about this evening, by way of introduction, we've got to talk about a topic that is not written about directly in tonight's Tanya. But it's a really important topic. And it's a very tricky topic. It's quite esoteric. So fasten your spiritual seatbelts and let's go for a ride. At the moment, it's actually probably the best week that we could have chosen to have this conversation because at the moment we're reading the Torah portion that describes the long-term conflict between the two brothers, the twins, Yaakov and Asaph. Now, what do we know about these two twins? Other than the fact, obviously, that they're twins and obviously they're very different personalities despite being twins. But what do we know about them? So if we were to draw a profile of Yaakov on the one side and a profile of Esav on the other side, it would probably look something like this. Yaakov, what a mensch. What a lovely guy. You really, you should meet Yaakov. He's the most amazing person, straight as an arrow, deep, insightful, sincere and we know this because the Torah describes him in exactly those terms. The Torah says that, the, that he is somebody who dedicates his time to Torah learning. He is involved in all the right stuff. His life develops in a very healthy way. Even when he is in the most challenging of circumstances, he still does what's right. And not only himself, but conveys those values to his children as well. And they are able to uphold those values. Yaakov is an absolute mensch. He is the archetype of what every Jewish person should aspire to become. Now let's do a profile of Esav. What kind of a guy is Esav? Esav's a vilda chaya. What a, he's such an unpredictable, unhealthy individual. He gets involved in everything that you shouldn't. At the younger stage, he's already killing people. He's a womanizer. He's an idolater. Bad guy. Not only is he a bad guy, but he's also, and this is the interesting part, if you had to theoretically put Yaakov and Esav in a boxing ring, uh, th I think the bookies would have a very easy time working out who's going to win. Because Esav is aggressive, he's forceful, 
he, he gives the, impl- the, the, the impression of having a tremendous amount of energy. It's not necessarily healthy energy, but there's a lot of it. Yaakov, on the other hand, calm energy. He's not a fighter. He's not going to an MMA match with his brother. He'd rather move out of town and go live with his wayward uncle for 20 some years to avoid his brother. So what's the spiritual significance of these two personalities besides the obvious, which is that they're very different personalities and they probably are represented within society because you get the one kind and you get the other kind in society. But beyond that, what, what lies beyond that? You know, when the Torah tells us stories, even if it's the stories of individuals, it is never only the story of individuals. If the Torah tells us a story, you must know that there are layers behind layers of the depth of that particular story. And these characters were chosen because there were many other people who lived at the same time. But these characters were chosen as the the heroes or the villains who would be shared with us because they represent entire spiritual realities. Yaakov represents one spiritual reality and Esau the other. And you know what's interesting about it? You see it right at the beginning. Right at the beginning, before they're even born. So their mother Rivka is pregnant. She doesn't know that she has twins at that point in time. But she gets this chaotic sense of what's going on inside her womb. And she starts to imagine that she's got a crazy child. She's highly concerned about this. And goes to the local prophet at the time who is Shem, the son of Noach. And she says, give me a prophetic ultrasound. (laughs) What's going on over here? So Shem tells her, Shnei goyim bevitneich. You think that you've got two, but first of all, the good news is it's twins. Not only is it twins, these twins are now going to be the fathers of two great nations. Those two nations will forever battle against each other. And the greater of the two will be subservient to the junior of the two. Obviously saying that Esav is going to be subservient to Yaakov. Now let's take this all much deeper. When Hashem created the world, uh, I don't know how much Kabbalistic homework you've done or maybe you go to bed at night with a Zohar. I, I, I don't know how much Kabbalah everybody knows. But perhaps what you might have heard, which is not even in Kabbalistic sources, it's actually in Midrashic sources, is that before Hashem created the world as we know it, he created worlds and he destroyed them. Have you ever heard that expression? Hashem created worlds and he destroyed them. Now, I don't know what picture you have in your mind at this point in time of Hashem creating worlds and destroying them. Maybe you have this picture of Hashem sitting in his workshop, ripping up or scrunching up blueprints of another world that's just not going to work and he throws it in the trash. Or I don't know, maybe you've got this picture of Hashem looking through a window at all of the universe and sending out laser beams and saying that's a failed world boom destroy it now obviously all of that would be completely nonsensical because it's only human beings who are capable of trial and error with Hashem there's no trial and error there's no such thing as experimentation oops that one didn't go according to plan let's try again so what does it mean that Hashem creates worlds and destroys them The deeper Kabbalistic meaning is that Hashem creates before our world, which is a sustainable reality, Hashem creates another reality that is an unsustainable reality. And each one is given a name. So there are two parallel realities that coexist. It's not that Hashem destroyed one and then created the other. It's that Hashem created one reality to exist in a sustainable way and one reality to exist in an unsustainable or chaotic way. What's the word in Hebrew for chaos? Toihu. So the one reality is called the reality of Toihu. And the other reality is called the reality of Tikkun. So if Toihu means chaos, Tikkun means order. Tikkun means that which is fixed, that which is sustainable, that which works. So there are two realities that Hashem creates, parallel realities. One is in a state of complete chaos. One is in a state of complete sustainability. Now, let's try and analyze why the one reality would be more sustainable than the other. There are many, many, many different reasons. But let's look at a few. 
One way that something is unsustainable is if it is starved of resources. Say, if, for example, we would take a Jewish community and plonk them down somewhere in the world where there is no access, God forbid, to the ingredients for latkes, that would be the end of that community. There's no way we could sustain. So the one way in which a, a reality is not sustainable is if it doesn't have the resources that it needs in order to survive. The opposite is also true. If there are too many resources, it's also unsustainable. So for example, let's use another example. The desert, the Torah tells us, is mokoim, that is loim moishav adam. It's not for human habitat. Why is the desert not suitable for human habitat? Because it doesn't have enough water. And without water, you can't sustain a human settlement. So the lack of resources makes the environment unsustainable. There are certain parts of the world where unfortunately human beings don't necessarily do their research and they land up living in floodplains. That's also not sustainable. Too much water. So if the environment where people live is low-lying or near a river that has a history of flooding or in an, an environment where there are tidal waves or hurricanes, any place where there's going to be too much water is as unsustainable as a place that doesn't have enough water. So in the case of the world of Toihu, what makes that world unsustainable is not the lack of resources, it's the overwhelming abundance of resources. So the description the Kabbalists give of this world of Toihu is that every single thing that exists can only exist if it is a composite of what we call Oir and Kali. Oir literally translates as light, but it could also translate as energy. And Kali translates as vessel or structure. So, let's say I've got too much structure and not enough energy. Then we'll say, welcome to South Africa. Too much structure and not enough energy. So you're going to have power outages because there's too much Kali and not enough oil. But I'll also say, welcome to South Africa. And I don't know if you could pick it up on the video or not. Right now, there's a massive lightning storm going on. And last night in the lightning storm, this building was struck by lightning. So a whole lot of functions in this building are not working today because they were hit by lightning. Too much oil, not enough Kali. In fact, we could resolve the first issue if we knew how to harness the second issue. In other words, if we don't have enough oil, we don't have enough energy in the country, if there was a way that we could, that we could create a Kali that could hold lightning, we wouldn't have a problem anymore because we have more than enough energy in a bolt of lightning, not enough Kali, we don't have a strong enough container or structure to be able to chap and hold on to it. So everything that exists only exists in a sustainable way if there is a healthy balance between our energy and Kali structure. If that balance goes out of whack, things fall apart. The world of Toyu is a reality of chaos. Why? Because there's too much blinding divine light and not enough structure to be able to harness it and use it in a meaningful way. It is the world of lightning bolts. And so the Kabbalists tell us that what happens in the world of Toihu, as happens in any system that is overloaded with too much energy, or as we'd call it in the world of electricity, an energy surge, what happens is sparks fly everywhere. And nobody can control where those sparks go. So the world of Toihu, which is a place of immense divine energy, lacks the channels to use that divine energy in a meaningful way and so the sparks go everywhere and we land up as the principal teaches kol ha govoya govoya biyoyser the higher something is in its spiritual origin yored le mato mato yoyser the lower it will descend if the system fails now if that sounds a little bit far-fetched let's put it this way 
if you have a little battery that is supposed to operate, let's just say, a portable uh, flashlight. If that battery overloads, something goes wrong, there's a surge of power from your 9 volt battery, nobody's going to get hurt. Nothing serious is going to happen. Maybe you'll blow the, 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 the actual globe of your flashlight. But when you've got a lightning bolt that strikes a building, the sparks fly everywhere. Nobody can control what happens next. So the world of Toyo is exactly like that in spiritual terms. There's this intense divine energy that is blindingly powerful. Nobody and nothing can control it. So the sparks fly everywhere. And even though they start at the highest possible place, they land up in the most unlikely, lowly realities. What that means is that in Toihu terms, the greatest potential very often lands up in the least likely candidates. Like Asav. That's Asav's story. Asav is a Toihu soul that has immense potential. That's why his father wants to bless him because his father wants to harness that potential. And when the blessings don't work for, for Asaph, then the rest of Jewish history is Jews trying to wrestle against Asaph's descendants to try yet again to harness and direct that, that energy so it should be healthy instead of being a, a colonial, capitalist, conquering destroy everybody else in, in the wake of your victories kind of energy. So Asav is a perfect pers persona of the Toyo reality. Huge potential that he doesn't have a clue about. Zero discipline, no direction. And so he lands up in the worst places possible. Yaakov, by contrast, is a Tikkun personality. Tikkun is where there's a nice, healthy, comfortable relationship between the Or and the Kali. The engineer has done his work properly. Everything works. Everything fits. Everything is calibrated. There's no 220 volts running through 110 volt American appliances. Everything's good. We, everything works. And it works as it should. And it is sustainable. There's no drama. There's no chaos. There may not even be the brilliance and the excitement of Asaph, but slow and steady finishes the race. And that's the reality that Yaakov comes from. Everything is neatly packaged in its appropriate hierarchy with appropriate and healthy networks so that you can tell this goes here at this time, you follow the following steps, you make spiritual progress and slowly, slowly you change the world. In Yaakov's reality, it's very easy to identify where the value lies and therefore to pursue the value. In Asa's reality, nobody knows where the value lies. And so you just feel intimidated by this bully who doesn't actually look like could ever be rehabilitated. With that in mind, with that Asav Yaakov, Toihu Tikkun information in mind, we understand that the purpose of life is Verav Yavoid Tsoir. The only hope for Asav is to follow the instructions and the and the teachings of Yaakov. Now Asav doesn't want to, right? Asav's a Vildachaya. He doesn't want to listen. No, don't tell me what to do. I'm a big bully guy. Don't tell me how to behave. But slowly, slowly, remember, Yaakov has a tremendous amount of patience. Everything has its time, everything has its plan, everything has its place. So Yaakov says, that's okay, I've got 2,000 years to do this. We'll slowly, slowly rehabilitate Asav until guess what? One day Asav's going to turn around and say, what is this? How dare people fight wars and steal each other's countries and treat women as less than men? And we're like, hi Asav, we've been like feeding this to you for the last 2,000 years. So the real focus of, of this evening is not so much about the synthesis of Yaakov and Asaph. It's about understanding the difference between the realities of Toyu and Tikkun because the Toyu reality is going to be very significant to what we're going to learn this evening. Because what we're going to learn this evening is that the world of Klippa, 
as it presents remember klepa is a reality that can only exist in our universe there is no klepa in heaven there is no klepa in the higher spiritual worlds klepa exists in our reality klepa manifests as obstruction to godliness it's the stuff that blocks us from doing what we're supposed to do or from being able to experience hashem in this world that's what klepa is we're going to say immediately that there is one class of klepa that seems to be totally toxic that's what we're going to speak about in this chapter and in order to have that conversation we have to preempt a very important question how could anything be completely toxic that doesn't make any sense Hashem is everything there's nothing else besides Hashem how could anything be toxic Surely everything has to have a little bit of good in it somewhere. So yes, the answer is yes, of course. Everything must have a spark of godliness. The question is, is that spark manifested in a tikkun way where it's useful and accessible and therefore it's likely to achieve its objectives? If that's the case, then it's not exactly clipper but if that spark of godliness is present in a toyhu way which means in a chaotic way where it doesn't add up logically that there should be spiritual potential in such a place well then the reality is when we look at that spiritual potential we won't be able to notice it and it's going to take a very difficult road of self-work and development to find that spark release it and elevate it so before we get into the details that we're going to discuss this evening it is important to know that the term clipper that we're about to discover is not something that is written off from access it's something which is toyhu by nature the access is not apparent it's going to take an uphill battle to get the positive out of it. Okay, I'm just going to pause for a second just quickly to address a question here. So is this an, an allegory for two different basic species of men, right? The Yaakov and the Esav, the Toyhu and the Tikkun. And I think it's fair to say that, that you could say yes to that. These are two kind of archetypes of human beings. And uh, it's also two archetypes of realities in the world. There are realities in our world that are associated with holiness and therefore associated with tikkun. And there are realities that are associated with the obstruction to holiness and therefore associated with toyo. So with that in mind, let's, let's just have a look at the chapter. Now, if you remember, uh, we got up to just where that little asterisk is. So you can see that there's a little inset, there's a comment on the Tanya that we're learning, where the last line before that inset on the second last, with the second last word on the line. To really understand the principle of Klippa, we have to understand that Klippa is divided into two categories. And those two categories are Zoi, Lemata, Mizoi. Now, the Alter is intentional in using this expression because whenever you talk about things of holiness, the expression is zoi lemaila mi zoi. You'll always say there's this level and then there's a level higher than this level because when you're dealing with the world of holiness, your direction and your aspiration and your movement is always higher. But in this case, we're describing clipper. Klippa is an aberration, it's an obstruction, it's an interference with godliness and holiness. Therefore, Klippa is zoi lemata mi zoi. That whatever we discover first, it's only going to go downhill from there. Now, the reality is that the way we're going to study these clippers, the two categories of clippers, is we're actually going to start right from the bottom. But it's just important to understand that the orientation of the clipper world is always downwards. So Hamadrega Hatachtoino, the lowest of the categories of Klippa, his Sholosh Klippois is comprised of three different types of Klippa. Okay, so there's two categories, and there are three Klippois in the lower of the categories, the worst of the categories. Now I just want to pause for a second. 
One illustration of this is that we're told that when Joshua led the Jewish people to conquer the land of Israel, or at that time it was the land of Canaan to become the land of Israel, they encountered seven, uh, seven nations that lived in Israel, seven native nations. And we also know, that, so they conquered all of those nations and they took over the land of, of Canaan. But we also know that Hashem promised Abraham, in addition to those seven, He also promised the lands of the Cani, the Knizi, and the Kadmoini. Three other lands, somewhere to the east of Israel. And there are various places in Jewish mysticism that those lands are seen to represent one or another type of spirituality. So one of the explanations is three lands to represent these three degrees of Klippa that are not conquerable. You can conquer the land of Canaan, which is a place of idolatry and a place of immorality, and you can turn it into the holy land. And you still can't get to these three clippers because they are cemented into their reality. There's no way out till Mashiach comes. So what we're about to talk about, we're not going to distinguish between what these three clippers are. We're going to just simply call them, as they do in the nursery rhymes, the three little clippers. So these are the three realities. Again, we're not going to specify what exactly distinguishes one from the other, but just suffice it to say that there are three dimensions of Klippa that are Hatmeos Verois Legamre that are completely toxic. Tmeos means impure, Roois means bad, Legamre. Now, as I said, we should immediately be protesting and saying, there can't be anything that's completely bad. How's that possible? If Hashem is the one who makes every single thing exist at every single moment, and Hashem is the essence of all good, how could things that exist be bad? Doesn't make any sense. So that's why I introduce this by saying the difference between the tohu and the tikkun reality. When we say that something is completely bad, what we mean is, that the spark of holiness within it has become completely overwhelmed by the clipper and no longer speaks like a spark of holiness. So let's understand this. Let's understand this from the kitchen. Right? The kitchen, one of the most dangerous places to be if you're a Jewish, an observant Jewish person. So what could happen in the clipper? Uh, in the clipper. I'm sorry, you see that? That was Freudian. What could happen in the kitchen? So what can happen in the kitchen is sometimes, unfortunately, you run a perfectly kosher kitchen, but two kosher ingredients mixed together with a result of something that's not kosher, particularly meat and dairy. So in the case of meat and dairy that, meet, that mix together, let's call it, let's call it, just for the sake of our conversation, it's not accurate, but let's just call it the mixture of something holy and something of clipper. Now, you can't really say that, right? So let's use an example that you can say it. Your kosher chicken soup is potentially holy. Sorry, your chicken soup is definitely holy. But other chicken soups are potentially holy. And then you've got a piece of non-kosher food. A prawn. A piece of meat that wasn't shechted. That is clipper. And it drops into the chicken soup. So what's the law? The law is fascinating. It all depends on how much chicken soup you have and how much of the stuff that was not kosher that fell in. Now, obviously the first thing you've got to do is get the non-kosher stuff out. Nobody can have chicken soup with 15 kanedlach and one prawn bopping up and down and say, it's still kosher because there's more chicken soup, right? You obviously got to get the offensive material out. But the question is, halakhically, what happens to the soup? So, if there's an overwhelming majority of soup to the non-kosher item, 60 to 1, then we say, irrelevant, you can go on, everything is fine. However, here's where it's interesting. If we don't have enough soup to neutralize the non-kosher item, then the whole soup is now not kosher. Which means... If some of this soup now spills into the next door pot of soup, it's as if the non-kosher item spilt into the next door pot. See what's happened over here? Something that is fundamentally kosher is no longer speaking the language of kosher. It's been overwhelmed by the non-kosher influence. The clipper has completely swallowed the Kedusha. The Kedusha's in there somewhere. There's still a spark. It hasn't disappeared. 
It's just been completely overwhelmed. When we talk about a so-called toihu reality in this earth that we, on this earth that we live in, what we're talking about is something where the spark of holiness has been completely swallowed and overwhelmed. You can't see it. So next time you walk outside and you see a non-kosher animal walking past, let's just say somebody's walking their pet pig down the road. Now I use that example because in every Jewish person's mind, that is like as trafe as trafe can get. So when it walks past, is there a spark of godliness in that chaza? Yes. Can I reach it? No. That's why I'm not allowed to touch that. Well, I'm allowed to touch it. That's why I'm not allowed to eat that product because I have no way to ever access the spark of holiness hidden inside of it. Uh, okay. <laughs> yes. Somebody asked the question. There's a song that we sing on Shabbos afternoon called B'nai Heichala. And there we speak about Levatola B'chol Klifin, that Hashem should neutralize all the clippers. And the question is, is this what we're referring to? The answer is yes. That's what we're referring to. Except over there he says all the Klippa, so it also includes the second category as well. Okay, so Klippa, for all intents and purposes for us, is a spark of holiness locked in a maximum security prison and we don't have the access codes. So the only thing that could ever happen to us if we try to get into that access security prison, that, that, that uh, what do you call it, that high maximum security prison, is we'll probably never get out. So that's Sholosh Klippa Satmeus the Gavarois the Gamre, the Ein Bohem Toyuf Klal. They have no accessible goodness as they are. Now, does that mean that there's no way out? Well, we'll see in the next chapter that there are some spectacular maneuvers that we could do that may make a difference. There's one incredibly important disclaimer you can only use those maneuvers if you got involved with the Klippa by accident. So nobody can volunteer and say, hey, I want to go out there and engage one of these clippers and rescue the godliness within it. Sorry, that's off limits. But we'll get there. We'll unpack all of that. These are the clippers, Venikrub and Markeves, Yecheskel, that are described in the prophecies of Yecheskel as Ruach, Seora, Vionon Godol, Goimer, the tempestuous wind and the thick cloud, which basically means a destructive storm. Umehen, it is from these clippers that the following things are given their life source. What following things? First of all, the first thing is that the reality of the sustaining soul of every person on the planet, with the notable exception and the unique exception of the Jewish nation, the average human being is a clipper being. The average human being does not naturally feel a sense of godliness within themselves. Do they believe in God? Very likely. Could they be dedicated to God? Very likely. Do they feel a spark of godliness as part of themselves? That is not a natural state for the natural, the ordinary human being on this planet. That's the gift that of, the, of the second soul, right? The gift of the second soul is that you have another dimension of, of what your truth is. But the average human being on this earth lives as part of the reality of earth, which is a reality of clipper, and therefore is not naturally aligned with their own godly spark that is embedded within them, keeping them alive. Doesn't mean they can never discover it. No, they can. That's why we speak about the concept of what is called Chasidei Umo Yisraelam, the so-called righteous Gentile, which is effectively somebody who works really, really hard on self-development and discovers that deeply embedded divine spark. But fundamentally, the human is not designed to be God-centric. The human is designed to be egocentric. And therefore, the godly spark is completely hidden. Now this is even more pronounced in Vekim Unafashas uh, called Bale Chaim Atmeim Basurim Bachila. This is much more pronounced in the case of an animal that is not kosher, an animal that is forbidden for us to eat. There too, Vekim Gufam, as well as the sustaining of their bodies, they all live because of a spiritual energy 
that is not identified as holy. Why are we not allowed to eat a beef steak that wasn't shechted properly? It's not a cultural thing because Jews don't eat certain animals. It's beef. It's the same beef that we eat at a kosher restaurant, except it wasn't shechted or it wasn't cleansed of blood in the way that the Torah mandates or the salad wasn't cleared of, of insects which are forbidden to eat. What's the problem? The problem is anything that belongs to that world where the Torah has said don't go there, the reason the Torah says don't go there is because the spark of holiness there is locked at a level we can never access. There will never be benefit to a Jewish person, and this is limited to a Jewish person, the rest of the world is not a problem, they were never forbidden from partaking in these things. But for a Jewish person, there is zero benefit to engaging with that part of the world by eating a food that comes from an animal that is mandated by the Torah as non-kosher. You can never get spiritual value out of it. To the contrary, it is designed to swallow a person and drag them down. Remember, the non-kosher stuff falls into the soup. If there's not enough soup to combat it, the whole soup now becomes non-kosher. If I don't have the wherewithal to combat the black hole of spirituality that exists in Klippa, then not only will I not rescue whatever divine spark lives inside it, but I'll get sucked into the black hole and I'll become tainted and contaminated. And just as that is in the animal kingdom, likewise, Vakim Vachayus, the same applies to the sustainability or the so-called soul, and I use that word very broadly, of kol ma'cholos asuros mehatzomeach. The same thing will apply to anything from the plant kingdom that is forbidden for a Jewish person to eat. Now, most people think that non-kosher food is meat or maybe dairy and certainly certain seafoods. Many people are unaware of the possibilities of plants that are not kosher. And I'm not talking about plants that have insects in them because it's the insect that's not kosher but there is produce from the plant kingdom that is fundamentally not kosher kamoi orla like for example the fruit of a tree in the first three years of the tree's life that is not kosher vekila akerem chulei or if a person has a mixture of two different species that grow together and this is by the way uh, specifically in Israel so those are non-kosher foods, even though they're plants and nobody has to shech them or cleanse them of blood, etc. That is totally stuck in the world of absolute klipa. And it gives us a reference where the Arizal, the great Kabbalist Rabbi Isaac Luria, discusses this in detail. And the last part may well be the most important for us. What is the life-giving energy of non-kosher food, or in this case, non-kosher behavior? Absolute clipper. Kola maise, dibur, umachshava. Any action, any discussion, conversation, speech, or any thought, shall kol shaso loise sevan feyan that belongs to any of the 365 prohibited behaviors that the Torah lists, what we call the negative mitzvahs, ve'anfe'en and all of their subcategories, that is all absolute. Klippa, Kamosha, Kosov, Shom, Sof, Perekei, as the Arizal discusses over there. So what are we learning here? Actually, really interesting. Earlier in the chapter, the Alter Rebbe told us that the majority of the experiences in our world are clipper experiences. Our world is effectively, whatever the, I don't want to put a percentage on it, but let's say like 90% clipper. That means to say that our world, the reality that we live in, is primarily not aligned with holiness. That's what we've learned. Now, where does this actually play out? It plays out in the humans on the planet. The humans on the planet, we have very high expectations of those humans. We expect them all to be moral. We expect them all to be honest. We expect them all to pursue justice and goodness. So we have to acknowledge that while those are all expectations we should have of society, it's important to acknowledge that they are not natural expectations from society. 
Because society, by and large, lives in a world of klipa that is not naturally inclined to do the right things. It has to learn how to do the right things. There's a huge amount of uh, species of creatures on this earth that the Torah tells us we may not partake of. We're allowed to use them for other things. You want to have a snakeskin wallet? By all means. You want to use a, 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 an artificial valve, a heart valve from a pig? No problem. Torah does not have an issue with that. But to eat food where it becomes part of our system, absorbed into our bloodstream, and therefore the mystics tell us actually has an influence over our character, as we'll learn later on, those animals they're locked out of spirituality they, their divine spark is so deeply embedded we can't get to it so we're not allowed to touch those animals we're not allowed to eat those animals we're not allowed to eat those vegetables but I think really the most valuable lesson out of this whole chapter is the very last line because those are our choices we don't choose how another person is going to be we don't choose which species of animals or of plants will be kosher or not but we absolutely do get to choose how we think, what we say, and how we behave. And if there's one take home from this chapter, it is that in order to be holy, we need to align our behavior with what Hashem wants. And any time that we misalign our behavior, we create a clipper in our own world. We create a barrier to godliness through the things that we think, say, or do that are misaligned. That's a totally different perspective to what we're always told. Don't do what's wrong because you'll get punished because you're going to be roasted for eternity. It's got nothing to do with being punished. Why would any person consciously create a barrier between themselves and Hashem? And that is the food for thought that this chapter leaves us with. The next chapter will look at the second category of clipper, a clipper that is not as intense as the three we've just examined now, and therefore opens a door of possibility for us and starts to describe what we need to be doing in this world. Remember, so far we've described what our assets are. We have a godly soul. We have Torah and mitzvahs. Torah and mitzvahs activate the godly soul. But we then have a nagging question. So then why do I have an animal soul and why am I living in a world that is full of clipper? Well, for that... The next chapter will start to give us a little bit of insight and understanding.